Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that we are going to be covering today is one that hit the news and social media like crazy and I wasn't originally going to cover this case because of that, but I was getting a ton of suggestions to go ahead and cover this case and I asked my Patreons if they would like to see this case covered and they said yes. And honestly, the more I saw online about this entire thing, the more interested I got. The way I've seen it discussed on social media and in the news, it just seems so black and white. The government is about to put a very clearly innocent man to death because someone else set him up and got away with the crime. It seems so crazy to me and obviously such an injustice to put an innocent man to death, but I honestly don't really think it's that simple and I hope you see that through the course of this video. Now, I do want to warn you that through my research, I found that a lot of articles are very biased. They seem to put a lot more emphasis on some facts and then kind of gloss over other ones that, you know, maybe didn't fit with what they were trying to portray. So I honestly did my best to gather what I saw as accurate, factual and unbiased information. I may have some views on particular aspects of the case that you don't agree with, or you may see something in this video that you haven't heard online or in the news. I will say that, you know, when you see a lot of these cases on social media, they don't give you a lot of the details. They just want to give you like a general summary of, you know, what's going on, what the case is all about and what their opinions are on it and some of it can be untrue and people just believe it. Now, I'm not saying that a lot of what people are saying online is untrue, but I just want to say that there's a reason for everything in this case and I will tell you those reasons as we go on and I just want to make sure that we get all of the information, all of the factual information and details in this case before we make a snap judgment. The goal of this video is to give you the most accurate and clear information so that you can come up with your own opinion on what you think is really going on here. And I also want to mention that this video in particular, I want to focus on the victim. Again, I know a lot of videos that are going around about this exact same case are focusing on the people who may or may not be involved, but as with all of my videos, I want to focus on the victim. So that's where we're gonna start. So with all of that being said, let's just get into the video. Stacy Stites was only 19 years old when she disappeared in the early morning hours of April 23rd, 1996 from Giddings, Texas. Stacy was a beautiful young woman who was described as being vivacious, friendly, and outgoing by her sister. She loved all sports, being active, and had played basketball at Smithsville High School before graduating in June of 1995. Stacy was engaged to a 23-year-old man named Jimmy Fennell Jr. and he was actually the police officer for the Giddings Police Department. Most of the month of April had been spent planning for her wedding, working like crazy hours to earn an extra 50 cents so that she could save up enough money for the perfect wedding dress, for the perfect wedding, and she wanted to just have this large and amazing party for everyone to celebrate her getting married. But that wedding would never happen. Now, the day that Stacy went missing, according to her fiance, Jimmy, she had left their apartment driving his red Chevy pickup truck for work for her 3.30 a.m. shift at the Batch Stop HEB grocery store because the two had actually shared one car between them. That's why she was driving his red pickup truck. Her commute was decently long. She drove about 30 miles through the Long Pines for along Highway 290 to get to her work. However, she never actually ended up making it to work that day. Her mother, Carol, received a call from a coworker who said that she didn't actually show up for her shift. At 6.45, Carol called Jimmy to let him know about his fiance's disappearance. And by 7 a.m. on April 23rd, Carol reported Stacy as missing. Now that same morning, a Bastrop police officer was doing his normal rounds when he actually found that Jimmy's red Chevy truck was parked at the Bastrop High School, not at the HEB where Stacy actually worked. Now, when Carol called Jimmy that morning when she went missing, he said that he was sleeping when he received the phone call, but immediately set out to help Carol find Stacy. 
Now, apparently Carol actually lived in the same apartment complex as Jimmy and Stacy. So when he got the phone call, he just walked downstairs to Carol's apartment and then they drove together in her car to set out on their search for Stacy. But by 3 p.m. that same afternoon, a searcher actually stumbled across Stacy's body not far from where she went missing. She was actually found in a wooded area off County Road 1441, just seven miles outside of the city limits and only 10 miles away from where Jimmy's red Chevy pickup truck was parked. Stacy's body was twisted at the waist. Her arms were positioned over her head. She had no shirt on. Her pants zipper was broken to the point that you could actually see her underwear and she had ligature marks around her neck. Near her body was a balled up white shirt and a belt that looked to match the ligature marks around her neck. Her fingernails also looked like they had been cut down to the knob, very rough and not filed, almost as if someone was trying to remove any evidence that could have been found under her fingernails, but I will get more into this later. Now, of course, as with a lot of cases like this, police immediately looked into Stacy's fiance, Jimmy Fennell. They thought that the belt found near Stacy's body may have belonged to Fennell, and obviously his truck was parked in a very strange spot, and he really could not account for his whereabouts that morning besides saying that he was just at his apartment sleeping. He was questioned the day of her disappearance on April 23rd, and then he was questioned once again on April 25th. Then on April 29th, Jimmy actually went to the sheriff's office himself to tell them about some items that he thought looked out of place in his truck. The truck had been searched, but there was really no forensic examination done, and then it was just returned to Jimmy afterwards. Words. This was extremely irresponsible because this took away any chances of a proper forensic investigation on the truck. Before long, Jimmy was no longer seriously looked at as a suspect in Stacy's murder. Investigators said that there was no way that he would have been able to murder Stacy given the timeline. The lead investigator, Lynn Wardlow, said that it would have been impossible for Jimmy to kill Stacy park his car before it was discovered at 5.30 a.m., then walk the 30 miles that it would have taken for him to get home in time for him to answer the call that he received from Carol at 6.45 a.m. They also tracked the mileage logs of all the Giddings police vehicles to see if there was enough miles for it to have driven from Gidding to Bastrop that night. But they didn't find anything. They also looked at taxi records and they found basically the same thing. So again, at this point, he was no longer being looked at as a suspect because they just didn't think that it was possible for him to have committed this crime in such a short window of time. This was despite some very sketchy circumstances that they seem to have glossed over and the fact that pretty much the whole timeline that they had was from Jimmy's perspective. He's the one that gave them the timeline that she left at 3.30 in the morning, but who knows if that's actually what happened. Now, on October 3rd, police actually administered a polygraph test on Jimmy that showed signs of deception when asked about the day that Stacy was murdered. Then, once again, on December 18th, Jimmy took another polygraph test, which once again showed deception. The lead investigator's explanation for this was just that Jimmy was so upset and distraught over his fiance's death that the polygraph results just were not accurate. As we know, polygraph tests aren't the most reliable and cannot be too heavily relied on. It is very possible that someone under such intense distress can have some physiological reactions that just don't really make any sense and make the test completely unreliable. So again, I don't put too much weight on a polygraph, but it really honestly does not look good for him. Another aspect of the case that seemed really sketchy is the fact that Lynn Waldlow never even requested a search warrant on their apartment that Stacy and Jimmy both lived in. He said that there wasn't enough probable cause to do the search even though this would have been standard procedure given that this was the last place that Stacy was seen alive. But either way, after about a year, police had sifted through 20 possible suspects and seemed no closer to finding who killed this beautiful young woman. That was until they found a DNA match to the semen found on Stacy's body. 
this DNA belonged to Rodney Reed. This DNA was found by matching it to other sexual assault cases that he had been accused of in the years prior. Now, there is a ton of controversy around all of this and I'm just going off of the information that I gathered. So to me, it looked like he had a pretty lengthy history of being accused of sexual assault. Now, of course, being accused does not mean that he is guilty. However, during this case, there were multiple women who came forward saying that they had been brutally attacked by him, but were afraid in the beginning that no one would believe him. We know that there's this thing that happens where if one woman is strong enough to come forward about her abuser, that other women feel empowered to do the same thing. When I say that a lot of these articles seemed very biased, either for or against Rodney, I mean that like a lot of details about his sexual assault in some of these articles were just glossed over. They just said something like, you know, DNA matched from a previous rape case and then didn't really go into any further detail, which I think is pretty important. We need to know what this rape case actually involved because that shouldn't just be something that's glossed over. Someone was raped. Someone was brutally sexually assaulted and we just wanna gloss over that. And I just think that that's something that's horrible about these articles. I haven't even gotten into the bulk of this case yet, but I just want you to keep in mind that to me, he's not completely innocent because there were so many women that accused him of violent sexual assault and just didn't want to come forward because they were afraid. And I think in a lot of other cases, we tend to believe the victims who come forward and say that they were sexually assaulted. But in this case, it seems like that's just a detail that a lot of people want to gloss over. And I'll get into more detail later. I don't think that there's a lot of evidence pointing towards Rodney being guilty of murder, but I don't think that that means he's completely innocent of all wrongdoing. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. I also wanna mention that in the sexual assault case in particular that linked him to Stacy's death, he was actually picked out of a six person photographic lineup by the victim and Rodney's DNA was found on the victim's bed sheets. A lot of his accusers had been previous girlfriends or relationships who just said that he was very possessive and violent at some point, but of course they just didn't think anyone would believe them. But either way, after matching his DNA to the DNA found on Stacy's body, 29-year-old Rodney Reed was arrested on April 4th, 1997 and was charged with the murder of Stacy Stites. When he was initially questioned, he said that he did not know Stacy at all. He said that he had heard of her from her being on the news, but he never actually met her. However, when he went to trial in May of 1998, his story changed. Seemingly after finding out that his DNA was irrefutably on Stacy's body, he admitted that he was actually having a secret affair with Stacy that Jimmy did not know about. He said that the two had actually slept together two days before her body was found and that they had to keep their relationship a secret because of the backlash that they would receive from their old fashioned small Texas town who did not like the idea of a black man and a white woman getting together. He said that the two met at a game room in the back of a Bastrop Diamond Shamrock station. He had said that this is where they had met up a couple times. Other places that they had met up were the Bastrop State Park gazebo and sometimes at his mother's house in Bastrop. He said that Stacy would sometimes call him from a payphone at Long's Market in Bastrop and witnesses had confirmed seeing him around town that convenience store late at night. So now I'm going to get into the testimony and evidence brought forth in Rodney's trial that landed him where he stands today. Rodney Reed was being tried for capital murder for the death sentence. Rodney Reed was being represented by court appointed lawyers who seemed to be ill prepared for the trial. There had been a lot of issues with gathering witnesses who could corroborate Stacy and Rodney's relationship. The Reed family had been through a few different lawyers, but none seemed to really do much for the case. About a year before the trial, Clay Jackson was put on the case, but by the time she had actually started building the case, there just wasn't a lot of time to gather the proper witnesses and gather experts and gather evidence, and she asked for an extension, but she was denied. 
So Rodney's defense was not as good as it could have or should have been. So in their opening statements, the defense said that Stacy and Rodney had been involved in a consensual relationship and that is why his DNA was found on her body. Of course, having this kind of affair would be pretty dangerous in such a small Texas town. The defense said that the only person who could actually account for her whereabouts that morning was her fiance who was also a suspect at one point and had no actual evidence to show that she had woken up for work that morning and left for work. She said that at one point, Jimmy Fennell found out about their affair somehow and in a rage, he murdered his fiance. He had the means the motive, and nothing to really give him a strong alibi. Now, before the trial, several neighbors, family members, and friends of Rodney claimed that they had seen Rodney and Stacy together kissing and acting like a couple in public. Rodney's mother, Sandra Reed, said that he was always dating several women at once, and she even said that in one afternoon in October of 1995, Rodney mentioned this new girl that he was dating who was engaged to a cop. Sandra was obviously concerned and was like, if you ever got caught with that girl, who knows what could happen to you and said that she did not want this engaged girl at the house, which as I mentioned earlier, they would secretly go there. But after that, that seemed to be the end of it. Because of this, he probably never mentioned to his mother again that he was still dating this girl after she warned him specifically not to. One of Rodney's cousins, Chris Aldridge, gave him an alibi by saying that they were actually hanging out in a lot near his home until 5 a.m. that morning, and then they walked to work together, saying that there were also other witnesses who could account for that exact story. Chris also said that he knew that Jimmy knew about the affair because Jimmy had actually confronted to them saying that he would pay for sleeping with his fiance. However, all of these different witnesses did have criminal backgrounds and could be seen as non-credible witnesses, so only one person was actually called to the stand during the trial who could testify for this relationship, which I will get into more in just a minute. I don't know if Sandra Reed, his mother, was called, but I know that none of his friends were called, Chris wasn't called, and neither was the witness who could confirm Chris's story. The defense said that they were afraid that after cross-examination of all these witnesses that their stories might fall apart. It was also mentioned that because of their criminal histories, that they didn't want Rodney to be seen as having associated with people with criminal backgrounds because that can show that I guess he might have a criminal background too. They also didn't want to open the door to give the prosecution the opportunity to call up all the alleged victims of Rodney's to testify about him being a violent sexual predator. He was technically never actually convicted of these crimes, so they didn't want to paint this picture that not only was he associated with people with criminal backgrounds, but he had a long history of sexual assault, which I can see why they wouldn't want to call these people to the stand because in a juror's head, it's like, well, if he's hanging out with all these people who are doing, you know, criminal things, then he's probably doing criminal things too. But because of this, there wasn't really anyone that could testify for Stacy and Rodney's alleged relationship. Now, the one person that they did call was a local bar owner who had discussed knowing about this relationship. However, when she took the stand, she seemed like she didn't really remember anything as well as when she had spoke to the defense before the trial. Clay Jackson said that her testimony was completely different than what she had said before and she thinks that this is because local law enforcement may have intimidated her. She also mentioned that after this woman's testimony at the trial, she was actually caught driving under the influence. So clearly this testimony was a lot for her to handle and she clearly seemed to be under a lot of pressure for whatever reason. I don't think that it's confirmed that law enforcement threatened her or anything, especially since the defense didn't express their concerns to the judge of witness intimidation, but that could explain her behaviors. Why would she be so concerned and so distressed about simply saying, yeah, I know these people, they, you know, have been in a relationship together, I've seen them at the bar, and, you know, other than that, like, that doesn't seem like something that is really that 
horrible or scary to say in front of someone unless someone has threatened you. But either way, her behaviors kind of supported the defense's decisions not to call more witnesses because if they had even more witnesses with weak stories like this and contradicting testimonies, it would have made them look even worse. Now, of course, prosecution brought forth their strongest piece of evidence and basically the focal point of this entire investigation, which was the semen found on Stacy Stites body. The defense's job was to prove that this was the result of a consensual sexual relationship between the two. However, a medical examiner testified that the semen found could not have been more than two days old. But the defense didn't have a medical examiner of their own, so the jury was just left with their opinions of this one medical examiner. However, years after the trial, he actually changed his opinion and said that there were very few sperm count in the sample and it's possible that Stacy could have been assaulted with a rod-like weapon such as a baton. Which I find really strange that he would go and change his opinion years later to something so specific that could have been a police baton. I wish I knew the context of his changed opinion and what made him change his mind and when he came out with this information I didn't really see anything about it. But either way, this was just another piece of evidence that seemed so flimsy that the defense didn't have much of an answer for and still couldn't really defend. He clearly didn't really know what he was talking about and if another medical examiner could have come in and disputed that and said, no, it actually is possible and here's why, the jury could have had a completely different idea in their heads. But either way, I did see someone bring up a good point questioning this semen being there for two days. Having it being there for two days means that she must have not taken a shower or anything to get rid of the evidence of having an affair or even just being generally clean for work. If she was having this affair that she was trying to hide, why wouldn't she have showered right away to wash away the evidence? Now, I don't know the exact specifics of where the semen was found, but if it was found somewhere on her body, I assume that it would have been cleaned off from a shower. Why would she have just not showered for two days and left another man's evidence on her when she is trying to hide that she is having this affair from her fiance? Again, I'm not trying to be biased, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here and making you look at both sides of the story. It is questionable why would it still be there, but at the same time, it makes sense that if they did have a consensual relationship and he changed his opinion on how old it could be, you know, there's not really much arguing that. Now, one of the prosecution's key witnesses was Stacy's mother. Like I mentioned earlier, she'd actually lived in the same apartment complex as the couple, and she said that after calling Jimmy about Stacy's disappearance, he was up right away and doing everything that he could to help find her and was involved in pretty much all of the search efforts up until they actually found her. She had also stated that again, the two shared a car, and that is why Stacy took his car to work. She claimed that at about 3 a.m. the morning of the murder, she heard the apartment door close and she heard one set of footsteps going down the stairs, which was Stacy's work routine. And then she heard nothing else until 6.45 that morning when she called Jimmy. Now, like we said earlier, there was really no one to confirm Jimmy's alibi until now. This can confirm Jimmy's alibi that he needed to prove that he was in fact home when she was. However, I also question this because unless Carol woke up at 3 a.m. every morning to listen for Stacy leaving for work, how and why would she have just been up to randomly perfectly hear all of this happen? If she was a light sleeper like I am, I guess I could see that. I am a very light sleeper, so if I hear someone leave and walk down the stairs, I probably would hear it and wake up from it. But how is she so sure that it was only one set of footsteps? I imagine that she probably would have been pretty groggy if she had just woken up from the sound of them, you know, moving around in the other apartment. So she could have easily thought that she had heard something different than what actually happened. Maybe there were two sets of footsteps. Maybe Jimmy left the apartment shortly after Stacy and she just didn't hear it because she was sleeping when he left. I don't put too much emphasis into Carol's testimony because while I think she was being honest with what she thought she heard, 
We don't actually know how credible it is because again, she was probably sleeping. She might've been groggy. She might've misheard something. So again, I'm just trying to see both sides of every piece of evidence playing devil's advocate and trying to get your mind thinking. Now, another really large piece of evidence presented in the trial was DNA evidence found on two beer cans that were found near Stacy's body. The DNA was analyzed and it was found to belong to former Bastrop police officer Ed Salmonella and former Giddings police officer David Hall, who is actually a good friend and neighbor of Jimmy Fennell. So this entire thing could throw an entire wrench in the police timeline that they originally came up with. Originally, it would have been impossible for Jimmy to kill his fiance and then walk the 30 miles back to his home in the timeline that I mentioned earlier. However, this DNA opened up the possibility of others being involved. If these two other men who just so happened to be police officers and friends with Jimmy Fennell helped dump his fiance's body or even just picked him up afterwards, it makes it totally possible that they could have done this given the timeline. However, it turns out that the defense was actually not aware of this before the trial and weren't really given a good reason why. This not being given to the defense before the trial didn't give them enough time to come up with a defense strategy for it. I don't know how or why this was brought into court without being given to the defense. This is something that isn't really allowed to happen. So I don't see why it was able to happen in this case but either way, I do want to fast forward and say that in 2001, Rodney actually found out about this DNA analysis that was added to his case file and requested an evidentiary hearing, which was granted. However, the court decided that this new evidence would not be enough to create a reasonable doubt for the jurors. So it really wouldn't have made a difference anyways, but I personally think, and a lot of people would agree that this would be enough, this would create reasonable doubt and would make jurors look at this in another direction if it was presented properly the first time. So as far as information about the trial and evidence, that's pretty much all I've been able to find. Of course, there was information that I left out because maybe I wasn't sure how accurate it was. Again, a lot of these sources seemed pretty biased and some information was only found in one source or it was different from another article. So that is the information that I did choose to leave out. So again, if there's information that I said in this video that you haven't heard or vice versa, information that you know that I didn't say in this video, it's just because I question the accuracy and you know, do with that what you will. So as you probably know, at the end of the trial, the jury did not rule in Rodney's favor. On May 29th, 1998, Rodney Reed was found guilty of capital murder of Stacy Stipes and was sentenced to death. But this did not stop him from fighting for his life. His execution date was originally set for January 14th, 2014, after many appeals were made, but it was pushed back again in February of 2015, and they tried to bid for a new trial in light of new evidence and changing opinions that I mentioned earlier. Like I said, the medical expert changed his opinion on the sperm found on Stacy's body, and the whole issue of the DNA on the beer cans found at the scene and other confessions and other testimony that I will get into in just a little bit. However, by January of 2018, this request for a new trial was denied. His execution date as of right now is set for later this month at November 20th, 2019. His defense team has filed a clemency with the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles that requested a grant of commutation of his death sentence since there's so much evidence of his innocence which I, again, will get into more in just a minute. And I will attach an affidavit of this clemency if anyone wants to read it. It gives a lot of information about this entire trial that I couldn't mention. So now I'm going to backtrack a little bit and give you some information that came out about Stacy's fiance, Jimmy Fennell. Turns out he had quite a run with the law in October of 2007 when he pled guilty to charges of kidnapping and sexual assault of a woman that he encountered during a domestic abuse that he was handling. He was called to handle this domestic disturbance and he assaulted her as he was driving her to the police station. He told her that he would hunt her down and kill her if she ever told anyone, which is just 
so horrible that this man, a police officer who this woman probably trusted, just turned around and sexually assaulted her after she had just been involved in a domestic abuse situation. It is absolutely horrific and just sent shivers down my spine when I read it because that's just the most horrible thing that someone can do. But either way, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison and was actually just released after serving those 10 years. But that's not all. According to multiple witnesses, Jimmy Fennell had a pretty lengthy history of criminal and just creepy behavior. The first complaint against Jimmy came from a woman who said that Jimmy followed her around town and that she had gotten a call from a police dispatcher who told her to step outside of her home one night and meet with Jimmy's friends, which is just so creepy. Then, two months before Stacy's murder, a man was beaten up by two police officers, one of which was Jimmy, before they were broken up by a county sheriff's deputy. Then, three months after Stacy's murder, Jimmy moved on pretty quickly and started dating another woman who said that when she tried to break up with him for being possessive and jealous, he started stalking her for a month, would drive by her house at night, shining his lights in her house, and calling her a B. When she filed the police report, an officer came to her house and pretty much just said that he was going to leave her alone, which is just terrible to me. However, later after they went to the police station to get a copy of the report, the complaint didn't even exist. So this just shows how sketchy and corrupt that police department may have been and just shows how obsessive and creepy and violent Jimmy Fennell's behaviors are. Even more damning information came from a Dallas police officer who attended a crime scene training with Jimmy in 1995. This officer said that at training, Jimmy Fennell described how he would strangle his girlfriend with a belt, shocking, if he ever caught her cheating to avoid leaving fingerprints on her neck. And again, I will mention that her fingertips were cut down to the nub. Who else would know to do this? Who else would know that there is DNA evidence left under fingernails? Rodney was not involved in law enforcement. He wouldn't really know that. He wouldn't think to do that, but someone who is involved in law enforcement would know. But either way, nothing ever came of that and Rodney's defense team never found out about this incident and I don't know why this Dallas police officer didn't come forward sooner. Then. Another witness came forward admitting that Jimmy had actually told a friend that he was out drinking the night of Stacy's murder and that she was actually in their apartment at the time that we now know of as her time of death, which of course completely contradicts what he had said previously. When he was asked about these discrepancies, he had nothing to say. On October 3rd, Jim Clampett, a sheriff's deputy in Giddings, said in a sworn affidavit that at Stacy's funeral, Jimmy stood over the casket and said something like, you got what you deserved. Other officers that he had worked with came out and said that he had said multiple racist remarks before Stacy's murder. And they said that he told them that he had a suspicion that Stacy was effing a black man. Then finally, in a sworn affidavit, a former inmate and cellmate of Jimmy Fennell's, Arthur Snow, came forward saying that... Jimmy Fennell actually admitted to killing his fiance. He stated that Jimmy was actually in the prison yard bragging about the murder. He said, Jimmy said that his fiance had been sleeping around with a black man behind his back. And then at the end of the conversation, Jimmy said, I had to kill my N-word loving fiance. Arthur said that Jimmy had actually felt safe with him because he had asked him for protection from other inmates, probably because he's a cop and probably thought that he was going to impress Arthur because Arthur was actually a part of the Aryan Brotherhood gang in jail. Arthur reported Jimmy's confessions years later when he saw an article that showed that someone else was in jail waiting to be executed for a crime that Jimmy had just confessed to. So that's it. As of right now, Rodney Reed is sitting on death row while desperately trying to get the board's attention to look at all of this new evidence and let him free. As you've probably seen, people all over social media are begging and pleading for anyone to rethink this case 
and get an innocent man off of death row. Now we have looked at the evidence, heard the testimony, and seen just how much of an absolute disaster this entire case and trial has been. Ben. Now again, like I said earlier, there is evidence pointing in both directions. It may seem very cut and dry that Jimmy confessed to this murder so he obviously did it. He had a history of harassing and assaulting women, but I do want to mention that just because someone had said that he confessed, that doesn't make it 100% true. I personally do believe all of these accounts and I believe the inmate who swore on a sworn affidavit that Jimmy did confess. But we also have to keep in mind that people lie for one reason or another. I also want to remind you that Rodney Reed has also had a history of women accusing him of being controlling and sexually aggressive. Clearly, both men have pretty sketchy histories and should be nowhere near women whatsoever. But do I think that Rodney Reed is guilty for the murder of Stacey Stites? I would say no. I think that there is too much pointing in Jimmy Fennell's direction to ignore, and there are multiple people who swore in sworn affidavits that he is racist and violent. The only question that I'm left with is why did these people wait for so long to say anything? All of these people who heard him say all of these racist things and the cop who heard him tell his dead wife that she deserved this, why did they wait so long? It just doesn't make sense. If they heard all these terrible things coming from their fellow officer, they should know this is not how they should behave. This is not a good look for any of us. So why would they just cover it up and hide it? It doesn't make any sense. But either way, even if Rodney Reed is responsible for Stacy's death, there is nowhere near enough evidence to put him to death. I'll come right out and say it, I am someone who does think that some people deserve the death penalty. I have expressed this in multiple of my previous videos, but I think that it should be only used in cases that have 100% irrefutable, solid evidence that the person is guilty. There needs to be a much higher standard than what we have now for the death penalty. And the fact that there's someone sitting on death row, despite significant evidence pointing away from him is disturbing. And it is a misuse of our legal system. At the very least, he deserves a judge who will look at all of this new evidence and hear out the new witnesses at the very least. That is all he needs that. That, that's what he deserves as a human being. So before I get into too much of a rant, that is where I want to end this video. I think that most people will probably agree that Rodney Reed should not face the death penalty. There is significant evidence pointing directly to Jimmy Fennell. He had the motive, there's evidence, there's so much pointing towards him, including a motive that should not be ignored. I will have some of the affidavits of these sworn testimonies linked below, as well as the petition that is set up to stop this execution. Thank you guys so much for listening to Stacy's story. At the end of the day, this is who this case is really about. Yet another young woman has lost her life due to the actions of a possessive, sexually aggressive man. She had so much life ahead of her and someone just selfishly ripped that away from her. So now I really just wanna hear from you guys. Do you think that Rodney Reed is innocent or do you think that he really is responsible? What do you think of these witnesses that came out years later admitting of all the horrible things that Jimmy Fennell has done? Please let me know down below. Anyways, if you liked this video, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please do not hesitate to send them directly over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion I get and every video that I make are direct suggestions from you guys. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.